Hello again. Welcome to the next CLD writing video. Uh, this is a short video which basically takes us through from reading into the actual writing process. So it may be a good idea to start off with a bit of revision and so test yourself on your knowledge of the things that we've been looking at in the last, in the last couple of lessons. So what can you remember about how the written mode is different to the spoken mode for when the young reader suddenly starts being confronted with books. That's one thing. Second thing, uh, the whole word or look and say approach to teaching reading. What's that all about? Thirdly, can you explain what phonics is? And can you explain the difference between synthetic and analytic phonics? Fourthly, what were the bones of the Jean Chow quotation about literacy? And lastly, but by no means least, we have Jean Chow's six stages of reading development. <clears throat> so hopefully you've remembered a lot of the detail from that. Uh, before we get stuck into children's writing then, to kind of tie up children's reading, have a think about that question. Now, you wouldn't get a question like that in the exam because the focus is on children's writing. But um, look at the ideas behind it. So unlike speech, which is acquired naturally, children need to be taught how to read. Now, to what extent do you totally, partially agree with that statement? Maybe you disagree with it completely. Um, in discussing that, think about the differences that we've talked about modally between speech and writing. Think about Jean Chal's research that she's done into the, the stages of children's reading and think about the different classroom approaches that there are to teaching reading. Unlike speech, which is acquired naturally, children need to be taught how to read. OK, we're now going to go on into children's writing. So do the following. Get a piece of paper, get a pen and hold the pen in your wrong hand. So what you're going to be doing is a dictation activity where you just write down exactly what I say, but you're going to be doing it with your other hand. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Write down the following. Shimdi Farkla. Shimdi Farkla. I'll say everything twice. Bir dilde bir kaç kelime. Bir dilde bir kaç kelime. Yazıyorum. Yazıyorum. So I'll reread that sentence again. Şimdi farklı bir dilde bir kaç kelime yazıyorum. New sentence. Bu kolay değildir. Bu kolay değildir. New sentence. Çocukların bu yeteneği Çocukların bu yeteneği Çok hızlı öğrenmeleri Çok hızlı öğrenmeleri bir mucize, bir mucize. I'll read that all again. Şimdi farklı bir dilde birkaç kelime yazıyorum. Bu kolay değildir. Çocukların bu yeteneği çok hızlı öğrenmeleri bir mucize. Right. How did you do? Tough, isn't it? Uh, not least because you don't know how to represent with graphemes some of the sounds that I'm making. Um, and tough, presumably, because you're unsure where the word boundaries are. Tough, because you're writing it with your other hand, simply to keep the lines absolutely straight. So to delineate it in some kind of clear way. So if nothing else, it demonstrates the tough nature of uh, children's literacy. There are some formidable challenges that all children have to face in order to become expert writers. Right, 
Now, which language do you think I was speaking there? No, not Russian. No, not Hungarian. No, it wasn't some kind of weird Darlington dialect. It was Turkish. And this is what it looks like on the page. So let me read it around again. Şimdi farklı bir dilde birkaç kelime yazıyorum. Bu kolay değildir. Çocukların bu yeteneği çok hızlı öğrenmeleri bir mucize. Okay, so did you get those word breaks? And did you manage to represent some of these words in some kind of reasonable form? Here's what the words mean. Şimdi farklı bir dilde birkaç kelime yazıyorum. Now that means I am now writing a few words in a different language. Now, language, now Turkish has a different word order from English. So it goes like this. Şimdi means now. Farklı bir dilde, different one language, literally. So in a different language. Birkaç kelime, a few words. And then yazıyorum, I am writing. So the main verb in Turkish, like in Japanese, goes right at the end of the sentence. And what we would have as the first person singular pronoun, I, that's the end bit of the verb. So Turkish is an agglutinizing language where you lump into single words a lot of the grammatical features for which we would have separate words. So yaziyorum, a single word, is I am writing. Bu kolay değildir. So this isn't, değildir, isn't. Kolay, easy. And then we've got the last sentence. Çocukların bu yeteneği çok hızlı öğrenmeleri bir mucize. So children, this skill, çok hızlı, very quickly, öğrenmeleri, learn bir mucize, is a miracle. Okay, so if you imagine any child learning to, to, to write has to make sense not only of individual phonemes but individual words and then construct them and put them together into syntactical structures which are standard for their language okay so that gives you some of the difficulties that everyday children come across in learning to write now what i want you to do is to make a list therefore uh, make a list of the various skills that children need to develop over time to become proficient writers, starting from the very basics of learning to hold the pen and going up to your age of people constructing essays. So think about the different language levels, like to do with Lexis and grammar and discourse, etc. What are the various skills that children need to develop over time? Pause the video there and have a go at doing that. You should be able to come up with at least eight different discrete skills. Okay, now, if you were in my class now, we would be going through these. So let's, let's go through these and let's add a bit of detail to these. Incidentally, this list is in your booklet. It's on page nine. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have what's called fine motor skills. Now, there is a differentiation between gross motor skills and fine motor skills. So gross motor skills are large scale physical actions that you do, like running or swimming or kicking a football. Those are gross motor skills. Whereas the smaller scale things like tying your shoelaces or writing, those are fine motor skills. So the very act of holding and controlling the pen is a fine motor skill. Now, if I go onto another slide here, um, so obviously what you've discovered from this activity that we did five minutes ago, that you know picking up your pen with the other hand is not a, a natural activity, and therefore you need to build up the kind of muscles to cope with doing that. Um, 
And when people develop their handwriting, they usually go through these sorts of processes. So we start off often with cylindrical grasp like that, a bit like the murderer in Psycho gripping the whatever it is. So that's called the cylindrical grasp. And as the child gets o older, they sort of uh, go through these forms. So we then go to the digital grasp that looks like that. We have the modified tripod grasp and then ultimate hallelujah success here is the tripod grasp, which conventionally most uh, writers end up doing. OK, so this is about fine motor skills. Let's go back. Right. Next thing, recognizing individual phonemes in words. So let's say the obvious things that in English there is a mismatch between the number of phonemes that we have in the language and the number of graphemes that are available. We have 44 phonemes in English, 24 consonants and 20 vowel sounds. And we only have 26 letters. So we have to, uh, as a a listener, we have to recognize the individual phonemes in words for us to spell those words out. So if we're taking the word cat, for example, we've got to be able to recognize the k, a, t, that we've got two consonant sounds in there and we've got a short vowel sound in there. So phonics is based on the idea that children are able to recognize these individual phonemes. That's not necessarily easy because as we know from the fist phenomenon, some children cannot necessarily articulate some of the sounds of English. Take the sibilant affricate sound, sh, for example, as in fish. So that Burko study from the 1960s showed that there's a difference between what a child can understand and what they can actually articulate. So we have the whole problem of being able to recognize individual phonemes in English. Then we have the thing of recognizing separate words. Okay. Um, and that's obviously not going to be easy. So as I've said in previous videos, uh, when we come across uh, trying to write down words, it's a bit like when we're hearing uh, a foreign language being spoken on a radio station and it's just going like that and so it's a real challenge for the the child to know what is an individual word we then have learning the shapes of the graphemes and the numbers now obviously we have 26 letters in english but actually it's more complicated than that because we've got uppercase and lowercase now, for some of those lowercase ones, it's fairly easy making it an uppercase because basically you're just enlarging the scale. So take P, for example, all you're doing is making the P bigger in order for it to be an uppercase one. But there are, are of course, a number of ones which are different to that. So take R, for example, the rhotic R, which the obviously the, uh, the capital letter there is quite different to the lowercase letter or something like Q. OK, so there's the difficulties in just being able to formulate the shapes of both upper and lower case letters. Then we're into the whole uh, um, challenge of understanding the relationship between phonemes and graphemes by segmenting and blending sounds. So this is where your phonics comes in, whether it be synthetic phonics or analytic phonics. And English presents all sorts of problems because it's obviously a non-phonetic language and therefore it's not as easy as just going k at because some of our simplest words, let's take the definite article for example, T-H-E, you can't exactly sound out the t in order to make the. So what we have is digraphs, so we have combinations of letters that uh, go together in order to create single sounds. So sh for example, the SH and TH and TH for the TH. OK, so it's complicated in English, the relationship between phonemes and graphemes. We have the issue of directionality, linearity and spacing. So I don't know how you did on that task in terms of um, keeping the words on the lines and spacing out the words properly. Directionality, as I talked about in the last video, means basically moving from left to right. 
which is a feature of English, but obviously other languages may go the other way. We have linearity, which just means keeping words on individual lines. And then we've got spacing, like finger spacing between words. So it takes quite a few years for children to uh, master these skills of directionality, linearity, and spacing. We then have the notion of selecting appropriate lexis. Now here we can throw in this term hyponymy that we've used when we were looking at CLD speech. This is the categorization of words where we have hypernyms, that's H-Y-P-E-R-N-Y-M, like furniture, for example. And then underneath that, we've got hyponyms with an O, H-Y-P-O. So words like stool, chair, table. So uh, a child has to learn the categorization of words and to learn that in English, we happen to have quite a range of synonyms. So for example, in the park, the child might be saying quack when they mean duck. So quack quack or quack on duck have exactly the same meaning. So we have a whole range of different synonyms and equating into that, you've got notions of register as well, because there are some words that are high register, high levels of formality, and the other words which mean something similar, but are low levels of uh, register. So we have Lexis. We then have orthographical conventions. Now orthographical is just a posh way of saying spelling. So we have all sorts of rules in English that help us with this non-phonetic language. So why don't you stop the video there and try and write down a couple of rules that we have in English. Okay, so one spelling rule that might spring to mind might be I before E except after C, which is fine for a lot of words. Okay, um, the problem is that we have lots of uh, anomalies. Uh, it probably works for something like 80 to 85% of words where I before E except after C works perfectly. So take a word like receive, for example, R-E-C-E-I-V-E. -E. That works perfectly because the E-I goes after the C. But you can think of plenty of ones that actually break that rule. Okay, so that's one rule. Another possible rule, would, and this was probably something that you'd be taught at school, is, is the E marker, a.k.a. the magic E, the magic E rule. So this is where you stick an E on the end of a word, and what that does, it elongates the preceding vowel. So take the word mad. Okay, it's got a short vowel in the middle there. And by bunging an E on the end, you're elongating the vowel to a diphthong, going made like that. So a second example would be bit. Get your E on the end and it becomes bite. So this is called the E marker or the magic E rule. Uh, let me tell you another one. This would be about where do you put a single or a double consonant? Now, this is tricky in English. So take a word like sitting, for example. Now, the reason why we do a double consonant of the T's there is because it comes after a short vowel. If the preceding vowel is long, then we tend to use a single consonant. So sighting, as in the sighting of a caravan, S-I-T-I-N-G, only has one T because it comes after a long vowel, whereas sitting is after a short vowel, and therefore it's a double consonant. So a lot of these are very tricky, and of course there are exceptions to all of these things. So uh, difficult for children to uh, get their heads around. On to the next one, which is about syntax. Now syntax is about word order and sentence construction. So conventionally in English, we tend to go subject, verb, object. Uh, but of course, English being English, there are all sorts of interesting things that you can do with words where you can mix around the uh, conventional word order. And we have different sentence types. So we have minor sentences, i.e. non-standard sentences. We have simple, complex, and compound sentences, all of which um, depends upon the, like, the configuration of the words in those sentences um, are interesting. So we've got the application of principles of syntax. You've then got punctuation, okay, which is fundamental to controlling 
the writing. And I suppose you've got different levels of punctuation. You've got your sort of foundation level punctuation, which could be capital letters and full stops and maybe commas for lists. And then you've got your kind of mid-range punctuation, like apostrophe of omission, for example, and colons. And then you've got your harder bits of punctuation, like apostrophe of possession, or commas used to separate adverbials within sentences. So the conventions of punctuation are something that are accrued over time. We then have, going into sort of discourse here, the whole thing about structuring uh, a text and writing in coherent paragraphs. So here we're looking at topic sentences uh, and discourse markers being used at the beginnings of paragraphs. We're looking at the shapes of paragraphs and we're looking at things like anaphoria and cataphoria. Now, anaphoria, remember, is a reference back to something that's previously been referred to, and cataphoria is a reference to something that's going to come. So in the next section, I'm going to be talking about writing skills is a cataphoric reference. It's, it's pushing the reader forward to await what's going to be coming next. So all of that comes under stru structuring and paragraphing. And then penultimately, we move through into genre. This idea that, you know, different pieces of writing will have completely different conventions. But if you're writing a haiku, which is a Japanese three line rhyming poem of 17 syllables, usually about the ephemeral nature of existence, then there are certain conventions that you have to follow there. And the, certainly in terms of the way that it's laid out. And it's laid out in a very different way to a letter to the head teacher explaining why th you think that the school uniform should be changed. So the understanding of genre conventions is fundamental to ultimately successful writing. And then we've got this one here about proofreading and editing, which requires some sense of empathy and putting the uh, writer into the shoes of the reader who is coming across this text for the first time and is have to, having to construct meaning from it. So being able to reread texts uh, to make improvements to it, to assess things like the spelling and the punctuation and the paragraphing, um, proofreading and editing are absolutely fundamental skills as the child gets older and older. So it's a, it's a convoluted and complicated combination of different skills that children have to learn. And in truth, it's a kind of lifelong process, this. You know, writing is not something that's simply mastered by the time that children get to secondary school. But, you know, as we go through into adult life, I myself feel that I, as well, am still developing my writing skills. So that's all that we're doing for today. Thank you very much.